All right, hey guys. So thanks for joining me. Uh, as promised, this is my presentation from Data Week DC. And the journey that I'll be taking you on today is called the Science of Second Chances, a list programmer's foray into data literacy, opportunity, discrimination, and second chance candidates. So this time around, I'm gonna do things a little differently though. The first time I did this presentation, I had about a week to put it together and a 30 minute time frame and a very mixed audience as far as technical skills go. Um, since I had a little bit more time and a little bit more creativity control using this medium, I decided to break things down a little bit differently this time. The first part, which is this video, will be the director's cut of the presentation where I go over all of my findings. I'm not gonna get into very much technical detail, maybe I'll show some code, but I'm not gonna deep dive into it. Uh, the next follow-up video will be titled The Art of the Refactor, when writing code is more art than science. And that's where we'll do a deep dive into the code and you can follow me through my refactor of this code because for the purposes of the presentation, I kept it very simple. Um, but as I refactored it, you know, I realized there were so many things to discuss as far as just the myriad of different like architectural and stylistic choices and the pros and cons of each. And so that video is going to be for my fellow closure nerds. And uh, I would love your feedback on that. So if you've seen, the vi if you've seen this and you want to just skip to the code, go ahead and do that. Um, all right. So without further ado, uh, let's get started. I'd like to begin by thanking ATA for their sponsorship of Data Week DC as a whole and for their Zoom and webinar support during the presentation. Uh, there's special thanks out to Mike Gallagher because he really did his part and this would not have happened without him. So thank you, Mike. You're awesome. I've also included my personal links and information. So if after this talk you want to connect or you want to know more about me, here are all the places you can do that. I'll also share this during the end of the presentation. So this presentation will take place in three parts because I know there are so many different kinds of people in the audience from enthusiasts to experts to people that landed here because they googled what is data science. Um, so first I will share a little bit my, about myself and my background. Then I will discuss my methodology through the lens of a programmer working with data. I'll share some closure code that I wrote as an example of how a list programmer might extract, parse, and dig into a data set. Like I said, in this presentation, that'll be a little light, but we'll still go over it. Then I will share insights from a couple of relevant reports. I hope to be able to draw conclusions that will help to answer the question of whether discriminating against employee applicants based on the criminal record it is, is advisable when it comes to common hire pra hiring practices. So without further ado, let's get started. So some of you watching this will know me and some of you will not. So hello, my name is Jordan Miller. I am a self-taught programmer and I will begin this talk in the same way that my programming journey first began with the sacred textbook of functional programming, structure and interpretation of computer programs, SICP or simply the wizard book. Data scientists may be interested to know that the programming language that is used to convey ideas in SICP is called Scheme. What's especially interesting about Scheme is that the language itself is written and expressed as data. And when I say data, I mean lists of pure data. Like you can do data science on it data. 1979 was certainly a wild year. <laughs> Professionally, I do Clojure Script and Clojure, which are just some higher level dynamically typed Lisp languages that compile to JavaScript and Java. And they're much cooler. This project is my initial foray into data science, data literacy, and statistics in general, as well as my first time recording a YouTube video. So I hope all of you YouTubers and all of you classically trained data scientists will be easy on me uh, because I'm just starting, but I'm really enjoying it. So 
For what it's worth, when I first started researching for this talk, I made an attempt to try and figure out what the term data science even means. And as it turns out, for being such a hot buzzword, every single medium author in the world has a totally different opinion on this. I watched like eight TED Talks. Well, if data science is anything like computer science, the first lesson we must learn is how to apologize for the term computer science. Luckily for y'all, I have obtained special permission from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to share just a sneak peek of the rigorous training involved in technical apologetics. I'd like to welcome you to this course on computer science. Actually, that's a terrible way to start. Uh, computer science is a terrible name for this business. First of all, it's not a science. It uh, might be engineering, or it might be art. Or we'll actually see that computer, so-called science, actually has a lot in common with magic. And we'll see that in this course. So it's not a science. It's also not really very much about computers. And it's not about computers in the same sense that, that physics is not really about particle accelerators. And uh, biology is not really about microscopes and petri dishes. And uh, it's not about computers in the same set, sense that geometry is not really about uh, using surveying instruments. In fact, there's a lot of uh, commonality between computer science and geometry. Geometry, first of all, is another subject with a lousy name. Oh, Abelson. What a guy, am I right? So these are the original lectures that went along with the book SICP. If you're interested, MIT Free Courseware offers all these for free, and that's where I got all of my computer science knowledge. Um, so I, rec I recommend you check that out. Going back to what he was saying, when we think about it, he has a point, though. While not as lousy of a name as the term computer science, it's not exactly self-explanatory from the term data science what data scientists actually do. So data scientists, I'd like to ask you, what would you say you do here? Just kidding, I know, I know, you're the data people, you have all the data skills. Before I continue, I'd like to mention that when it comes to discrimination and unemployment, black indigenous people of color, LGBTQ, and women are all disproportionately affected by these issues. This topic alone can fill an entire presentation. And although I won't be focusing on those disparities today, I find it relevant to mention upfront. So we're gonna talk about it now. To expose a quick snapshot, here's a graph provided by the Prison Policy Initiative, and it shows the unemployment rates in 2008. The y-axis, shows unemployment rates from zero to 50%. On the x-axis, we see a juxtaposition of the unemployment rates of the general population to those of formerly incarcerated individuals. Notice the breakdown by race and gender. In the general population, black men and women are only slightly more likely to be unemployed compared to their white counterparts. But the breakdown of formerly incarcerated individuals tells a very different story. When being released from incarceration, Black women are unemployed at a rate of almost 44% compared to white men at 18%. This disparity is about 25%, which is very high compared to the 2% imbalance between white men and black women in the general population. And I wish I could say these results were shocking. And this data is even pretty old. It's from 2008. And I'm sure y'all know with the recent surge in unemployment and the current racial tensions we're experiencing here in America, I speculate that these numbers have only gotten much, much worse. 
So that's something that we should all think about as we're going through this presentation. So at the beginning of 2020, some other type of scientists estimated that the digital universe consisted of 44 zettabytes of data. That's 44 sextillion bytes. A page published by the University of Hawaii roughly estimates that there are about 7.5 quintillion grains of sand on all the beaches on Earth. So to put this in perspective, if grains of sand were like bytes of data, you would need more than 5,867 Earths to represent the amount of data that we have today. And that number is growing rapidly. Y'all really need to stop taking so many selfies and pictures of your cat. That might've been directed at me, but <laughs> So if you can imagine how hard it would be to process almost 6,000 earths of sand and then transform those grains into sand castles, then you can start to understand the difficulties that computer scientists and data scientists face when we're processing, analyzing, and even storing that much data. So remember I said that as a programmer, I love data, but I think this is where a computer scientist starts to kind of differ from a data scientist. When I say I love data, it means I love playing in the sand with data, building up the data and transforming it, rendering it like sand castles in an abstract sense. I had never really thought about the process by which the data got to me or what happens when it left my hands. So if I want to start thinking like a data scientist, I must examine and try and emulate their methodologies. So let's go build a sandcastle. Step one, if you're gonna build a sandcastle, first you need to find a beach. Asking the right questions is just as important as answering them. Step two, what tools do we have to help us answer the question? A sand shovel in a beach bucket is the difference between a castle and a mud pie. Step three. Well, I hope you brought your sunscreen because we are digging in to build this castle and answer the question. <sighs> Wait a minute. What was the question? The inspiration for this presentation stems from a story that I came across on Hacker News and a deep personal belief in the importance of second chances. The story, tweeted by Jessica McKellar, is about a prison inmate she mentored and how the inmate got a job in software after learning to code while serving time in prison. It's a really heartwarming story, but after reading it, I wanted to know if it's a one-off anecdote or a success story supported by data. So to pick a beach, I needed to figure out exactly what question to ask surrounding recidivism and unemployment, and then figure out how to examine the results so we can figure out the implications of hiring second chance candidates or job seekers with a criminal background. So now you know where the title of my presentation came from. So the question that I ended up settling on is, is discriminating potential employee applicants based on their criminal record, a sound practice for hiring candidates. So now we've picked a beach. We seek to find out whether it's a good idea to discriminate against those of criminal backgrounds when hiring candidates for a job. And now my favorite part, we can use our tools to play in the sand a little bit. So when looking for data sets on recidivism related unemployment rates, I was initially just overwhelmed with all the data available from the Department of Justice. First lesson in data science, check. Too much sand on the beach. And although we know what happens when second chance candidates aren't hired, since individuals without strong support systems, unfortunately often fall back into their own ways and end up back in jail. A topic that has not received as much attention is the job performance of second chance candidates when they are given a second chance and they are hired. 
This is what stood out to me about the following reports. This data set was originally collected from May 2008 to January 2014 by a hiring consultancy firm in the United States. Their primary aim was to provide a number of corporate clients with hiring recommendations. They conducted thorough pre-employment exams, including a psych exam of all applicants, and then they returned intermittently to gather additional data points on those who were hired, and if they were no longer there, the terms of their separation. This data is considered reliable, and it's featured in another academic work titled The Value of Hiring Through Employee Referrals. I would also like to note that this report captures data from individuals who have just any kind of criminal history. So it doesn't take into account the severity of charge or the kind of crime they committed. The graphic on the previous page specifically focused on those who had previously been incarcerated. Although these demographics are overlapping, they are not synonymous. You can get a criminal charge without necessarily going to jail. So after controlling for several attributes, the data set studied focuses mainly on low skill, white collar jobs typically a customer service or a sales representative at a call center. The other data set I will draw on is from the report titled, Does a Criminal Past Predict Work or Performance? Evidence from one of America's larger, largest employers. And wouldn't you know it, one of America's largest employers happens to be the military. <laughs> This looks to be the only other major work investigating the issue of criminal history and job performance. And we wanna note that this report assesses the performance of ex-felons specifically and captures about 1.3 million observations in total. So ultimately this is much larger than our other data pool. The data set was collected from the Department of Defense and it focuses on new active duty military enlistees who lack a college degree. These data sets and reports are complementary to one another. I will use each to help me answer some of the same questions, but ultimately they have several core differences and that prevents them from being compared directly. In the time that I had to prepare for this presentation, I wasn't able to get a hold of the actual data sets, unfortunately. But I'm not gonna let that stop me from playing in the sand. To simulate the process that I might go through to extract, transform, and load the data, I referred to the table supplied in the Northwestern report and added mock data to a Google Sheets document. I then downloaded the document as a CSV and I just got to playing with it using some of my favorite tools to do what I do best and write some algorithms. In the case of the Northwestern report, the initial applicant pool consisted of over a million applicants, but because we don't live in a perfect world, the, a lot of the data was fragmented and missing based on the client needs and preferences. So we can draw more accurate and reliable conclusions. First, the data needed to be scrub -a dub dubbed The closure code, I know I promised I wasn't gonna show you the closure code, but just refer to these little abstracted arrows and you should be just fine. The closure code I'm showing you here captures some of the techniques a software engineer might use to extract and transform a data set so we can draw conclusions from it. So first I created a closure project and I added a couple libraries to assist in importing and parsing the CSV. Shout out to Sean Corfield, we appreciate all your awesome libraries. <laughs> so from there, I turned the data into a list of hash maps, which is an associative data structure with each structure being one hired person. This data structure is ideal because many functional programming tools are meant to traverse down a list, applying a function to each thing in the list until it reaches the base case or the end of the list. This is a sample of what shows when I use my REPL to evaluate the value of all hired candidates, which is the result of the data transformation I just did. And if you don't know what a REPL is, I suggest you check out Closure and Closure Script because that's part of the best part of it. <laughs> so the authors had decided there were some key attributes that needed to be present for each candidate of the pool in order for them to be able to control for certain variables or draw reasonable conclusions from the data. And these are some of the attributes they found to be necessary and relevant. 
To code a Boolean true or false response, the integer zero is considered false and a value of one is considered true. So because we're looking at criminal history, that's very relevant to what we need to know. So of course, we need there to be a field present called criminal history. School measures whether a candidate has more than a high school education. Fewer short jobs and longest jobs are questions that take a peek at the candidate's stability in their previous jobs. And then position is the job assigned to a candidate once they're hired. The options were customer service, sales, technical support, other, or agent. Was it a secret agent? We don't know. Certainly secret to us right now. So to process all hired candidates even further based on these necessary attributes, I created this function called valid candidates that takes the list of all hired candidates and removes any person that has a missing field of relevant data. The authors also found that after removing people with incomplete fields, only the job positions of sales representative and customer service representative contained enough observations to draw useful conclusions from. So I filtered all of that down based on job position and whether the fields we needed to be present were there. We, at the end of this, we have a data structure that is similar to the one before, but it has all the candidates that we want to study. In the Northwestern report, the initial value of higher candidates was 58,977. But after applying these filters, they were left with a total pull of 10,659 hired valid candidates to study as a sample. So now we've removed all the seashells, we have a nice clean pile of sand to work with, and we can begin to build up our sand castle by asking the data set questions relevant to our ultimate question. Well, to know whether it's a sound practice to hire candidates with a criminal past, we need to think about the kind of attributes a potential employer would look for in a candidate and which candidates make and which attributes would make a candidate seem less appealing. At the bare minimum, employers will want to hire a candidate that will perform their job adequately, but the aim is really to pick the best possible candidates. The best possible candidates will have good job performance, which will then translate to maximum profits for the company. And some of these traits aren't really able to be measured tangibly, but one promising sign of job performance is tenure. Hiring and training new employees comes at great economic cost to companies. Considering this cost, we can deduce that it would be in a company's best interest to aim to hire employees that will have a longer tenure. Relating to tenure, another concern would be whether the employee's tenure at the company was terminated, and if so, the terms of separation. Whether it was voluntary or involuntary, which basically means were they fired or did they leave on their own? If it was involuntary, we want to know why they were terminated. Another way to measure the quality of higher candidates is by looking at their performance while on the job. The Special Forces Report follows enlistees in their promotion through the ranks. We can gain insight about how often those with serious criminal histories end up either excelling at their job or how often they're dismissed. So what is good job performance? We know it has to do with job tenure and getting promotions. These are two tangible ways that we're able to observe good job performance from hired candidates. So let's take another peek into a short code sample that might show us what it looks like to dig into the data and build a castle from the observations available to us. So as promised, I am not going to make you guys sit through this again. All you need to know is that at first, I perform some logic that separates the valid hire candidates into two separate pools, um, those that had a criminal history and those do not. And then I'm able to write some code that gets the length of employment um, for all of those candidates. So 
So I suggest that if you want to look more into this, uh, the next video is going to have a very deep dive into the different ways that we can do that and how I wrote the algorithm and what I was thinking as I did that. So the Northwestern Report, back, back to the Northwestern Report. The Northwestern Report finds that after regressing length of employment on each candidate, that second chance candidates stay employed on average 19 days longer than those that don't have a criminal history. They found that having prior poor job stability and inadequate schooling can reduce this number by two days. They also found significant differences between customer service representatives and sales representatives, with customer service workers staying on average 21 days longer compared to sales at only 18.5 days longer. Since call center employees on average make about $30,000 a year, if we calculate the difference in turnover rates and multiply that by the estimated cost from the company per terminated employee, which was estimated at about $4,000 by the people that collected this data, we find that this results in about 764 or roughly 2.5% savings on wages if a company actually hires a second chance candidate. So we find that because those with criminal histories tend to stay longer at their job, that that actually ends up saving a company money because they don't have as much of a turnover rate. Additionally, we can look to the Special Forces Report and we see that based on their predicted probability model, where the vertical whiskers indicate a confidence of about 95% that after six years of service, those who entered the military with a felony waiver are more likely to have earned promotions compared to regular enlistees. This disparity is especially apparent when felons are compared to those who did poorly on the AFQTP, which is the cognitive aptitude test that's given to enlistees. You can kind of think of it like an IQ test um, or those that did not complete high school. So having a felony is correlated with promotion as much as doing well on a military IQ test. That's pretty surprising. So now we've looked at some data that suggests it may be in a company's best interest to hire second chance candidates. But what about the risks? That's what everybody was thinking, right? That leads us to our second concern. Which attributes make applicants less appealing to employers? And although there is no recorded statistical basis for this claim, many companies would cite concern over liability as one of the reasons why they wouldn't hire those with a criminal record. And their concerns are pretty valid. Many of the things that lead to criminal justice involvement in the first place like crime and drug and alcohol addiction and mental health problems, and even just bad luck of the draw, disadvantaged background, may also make ex-offenders poor prospects for stable employment. So talking about that extended cut, we will dive into the code to analyze individuals who are terminated and the terms of their separation we'll see how often those are criminal backgrounds get let go for reasons of misconduct, which would include being fired for theft and just a wide variety of criminal actions. We will also examine whether they're dismissed for these reasons more often, and if so, how much more often? So to cut to the chase, like I promised you guys, we will go back to the Northwestern study that provides Table 5 as an illustration of their findings. They perform a regression on the data to find the estimated coefficient using a Cox proportional hazard model. And if you don't know what a Cox proportional, if you don't know what that is, don't worry. Just know it's a fancy statistics tool and just consider yourself super lucky that you've never had to use it. So their findings they find a significant difference in voluntary termination between those with criminal histories and those without, which suggests that 
those with criminal histories, second chance candidates, not only have a longer tenure, but they're also less likely to quit on their own. They found that schooling seems to have little impact and that once again, there is a notable difference between sales and customer service positions with customer service workers quitting slightly less often than their sales counterparts. So now we know that those with criminal histories generally have a longer tenure, and then when they leave, they're not quitting. We use the same statistical model to break down those who are fired. They find that having a criminal background does not predict a candidate being fired in the whole sample. Instead, they find that the traditional measures that typically predict a lower quality candidate also seem to correlate with being fired. So having poor job stability in the past and having a lower quality education, those are more accurate insights to predicting whether somebody will be fired as opposed to their criminal history. And analysis based on job position finds that having a criminal history holds no bearing on those in customer service positions, but in some cases, it does indicate a slightly higher chance of being fired for those in sales positions. So it's emerging that there's definitely a difference in job position. What we find here might be the most surprising thing yet, that having a criminal background doesn't correlate with being fired. Of the candidates released from the company, we examined the subset that were fired for reasons of misconduct. As I mentioned before, misconduct will include any of those dodgy behaviors that we were probably concerned about, and it consists uh, it generally consists of immoral or illegal actions like theft or fraud, damage to property, breach of safety protocol, just generally offensive behavior, drug and alcohol use. Um, less serious offenses can even just include insubordination, excessive tardiness or absenteeism, or even just profanity. So regardless of criminal background, on the whole of all hired candidates from the study, that first thing we found with all hired candidates, Misconduct charges are a relatively rare event, and they occur in only about 4.5% of the total hired candidates. In general, it's almost twice as common in sales than in customer service. Again, this is for all hired candidates, completely regardless of whether they have a criminal hit record. So when we go and we look at those with criminal records who have been dismissed, the report finds that if a candidate has a criminal record, it is more likely they were fired for misconduct when compared with a coworker with no criminal history. These associations again vary by job position, wildly. Customer service has a slight correlation, something we can't completely discount, but sales representatives are about 34% more likely to have been dismissed for misconduct. So again, having criminal record doesn't mean that you'll necessarily be fired. But if you are fired, there is a highly likelihood that you were fired for reasons related to misconduct, at least when it comes to sales positions. Going back to the other study that measures performance of second chance candidates, we have a chart that again uses this Cox regression model and it tries to predict to being dishonorably discharged from the military based on a legal infraction. So it'd be their version of misconduct. In general, enlistees have about a 5% chance of being dismissed related to a legal infraction. If you are a felon, you have a slightly higher likelihood at 6%. So 1%, 1% difference. However, what's fascinating about this graph is that it shows the biggest influence on risk of legal infraction is actually tied to education. So those holding below a high school education have a 9% risk versus felons at 6% risk. 
and those with a high school education or diploma being around 4%. So we see that yet again, past habits like schooling and job stability are a bigger predictor than just the one attribute of criminal history. So we reach our conclusion. Is discriminating candidates based on criminal record a sound practice for hiring candidates? On the one hand, the data indicates there may be many benefits to extending a second chance to those who have just made a mistake in their past. Employees of criminal histories tend to have a much longer tenure and the data shows they are less likely to quit their jobs voluntarily. This loyalty may be due to the fact that they have fewer hiring alternatives, or it may signify their gratitude for being extended an opportunity in the first place. Also surprisingly, they are no more likely to be fired than employees with no criminal history. Another shocking conclusion finds that in a military context, the Special Forces study shows that felons actually have a higher likelihood of being promoted if they have a felony. So maybe because they're working higher, working harder to put the mistakes of their past behind them. I don't know. On the other hand, the concerns that employers have regarding the possible risks of hiring second chance candidates can't be entirely dispelled. So if a candidate is fired and they also have a criminal history, the data shows that it is more likely that they got in trouble due to misconduct. For reasons that are not entirely clear, it appears that second chance candidate hire for the role of a customer service representative is much more low risk than the job position of a sales representative. So in an attempt to reconcile these pros and cons, we can perform a sample cost benefit analysis and we'll use dishonesty, which is a common type of misconduct. In 2015, the National Retail Foundation estimated the cost from each dishonest employee to be about $1,546. Based on the estimated risk of misconduct, when a company hires a second chance candidate, they increase their expected theft-related costs by about 2.8% of 1,546. So as an increase of about $43. The same company actually ended up saving about $746 in turnover costs on that same worker. So do we want to hire workers with the expectation that they're going to have misconduct and be fired? No. But if it does happen, ultimately the company still gained a little bit. These studies sampled very small pieces of the workforce as a whole, and it's totally worth considering that these are employees that had already made it through a screening process, despite their criminal history. A surprising motif that emerged from the data is that one of the strongest indicators of a low risk second chance candidate appears to be their level of education. Findings in both the Northwestern study and the Special Forces study show a strong correlation between lower than high school education and then qualities that would make a candidate less desired to employees. So given the findings of these two studies, it would certainly seem beneficial for those in hiring roles to reassess their assumptions about those of criminal backgrounds, since they may very well be potentially missing out on a previously untapped productivity pool. Furthermore, the data indicates that companies may have an opportunity to actually save money on wages by hiring those within that candidate pool. Although we note that there are some risks related to misconduct and we can't predict how that's going to ripple throughout the company. So if mass changes were made based on these findings, the higher candidate pool would then again change drastically and we'd have to just go back to the beach and start all over again. We'd have to do further studies to 
try to attempt to further verify and attempt to reproduce the conclusions on the data pool. So to quote the late great Jimmy, the castles made of sand fall in the sea eventually. So thank you guys. If you made it this long, I appreciate you. If you are a Clojurian, you can check out the next video that will take a deep dive into the code and discuss whether, you know, what to think about when we're refactoring. What is the art of the refactor? Um, and we'll see how programming isn't always necessarily science or engineering. It can be very expressive. Um, I'd also like to thank Again, Mike Gallagher, because without his guidance or his encouragement, I wouldn't have done this talk. Um, I'd also like to, like to thank Paula Giron for always being supportive. You're an awesome mentor and I appreciate you as a friend as well. And then also to James Tolton for being the best, most supportive partner ever. He listened to me run through this like 20 times. Thanks, Jay, you're awesome. He is actually also a Clojurian. Um, so maybe you'll see us around the, the conference track once the world opens back up again. All right, thanks so much and have a great rest of your day. Tune into the next video.